Good afternoon, ANCO community. Thank you so much uh, for joining the Southwest Center for Human Relations Studies here at the University of Oklahoma in, in Norman. For our monthly webinar series, I am Dr. Jenny Rongo. I'm the Executive Director of the Center and the Director of ENCO. And I'm very delighted to be your host today. I welcome you to use the chat box to tell us where you're joining us from so that we can get to know each other. Also share online using the hashtag ENCO webinars. Start the conversation online. For the month of April, we have scheduled three webinars. April 7th, we shall present Killing Me Softly, Suicide Among African American, Asian, Pacific Islanders, and LGBTQ plus students. The registration for this webinar is at full capacity, and therefore we are unable to take additional registrations. However, a recording will be uploaded to our webinars on demand page about a week after the live broadcast. On April the 21st, we are partnering with the Oklahoma Higher Education Network to present a panel discussion on Oklahoma Indigenous Higher Education. We have Indigenous faculty, staff, and students discussing the significance of sovereignty of Native nations and what this means for citizens in the higher education system, among other topics on access, retention, and educational attainment. This event is free. On April 28th, we shall present a webinar on diversity senior leadership roles within higher education. So if you're working towards becoming a CDO or you want to understand roles in diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, this is your uh, webinar. Please visit our website at www.enco.ou.edu for full details on all these opportunities. Lastly, our ENCO 2021-33 that is annual conference will be held June 7th to 11th. This will be a virtual conference. The registration should be open tomorrow. Our presenter today is Dr. Harley Starr. Dr. Starr earned her doctoral in education uh, from Idaho State University, and she is the director of the College of Southern Idaho's Blaine County Center. Her research focuses on the critical study of whiteness in higher education, the intersections of gender, race, class, family history, and the need for white people to engage in self-reflective practices to genuinely work towards anti-racism. Most recently, she called that a chapter in the new book entitled Whiteness, Power, and Resisting Change in U.S. Higher Education, a peculiar institution edited by Kenneth Roth and Zach Reeder. Dr. Starr's topic is using autoethnography to develop race cognizance in white folks on campus. We are very grateful for her expertise. Post your questions in the Q&A box and she will address them at the end of the presentation. And just a reminder that closed captioning and ASL are available for this broadcast. Thank you for joining us and help me welcome Dr. Starr. Thank you so much. So I would like to begin today um, with the land acknowledgement. Um, the land on which I inhabit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Shoshone Bannock and the Eastern Shoshone. We pay respect to the Shoshone Bannock and Eastern Shoshone peoples, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. So, um, welcome. I am incredibly honored to be here today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day um, to, to share some time with me. Um, my focus will be on using autoethnography to help develop race awareness in white people like myself. And to do this, I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about whiteness, white supremacy, um, and how it's necessary for people like myself to work on developing our own consciousness if we want to aspire to 
um, genuine anti-racism. So it's important to me that I start off today by recognizing that one of the great privileges of whiteness is being able to enter and then retreat from um, racial and social justice movements when we deem that it gets too hard or if we determine that the risk is too great. And it is, um, it's important for me to stress that for me personally, um, it can no longer be a choice. Um, it just can't. So for me personally, um, I, I am feeling really compelled to stand in justice even when it feels hard. And um, I, I hope that you'll all come along with me today um, because this can be a little bit tough to talk about. But perhaps um, as important, um, as white people, we cannot begin to find our own voices um, that comprise our own set of unique experiences until we're honest about who we are, where we come from, and how our lives have come to be um, and what we have. So today I'm gonna to give you an overview on how autoethnography can help us move forward. Um, to be clear, um, this is not about guilt or shame. Um, I personally feel that those are um, unhealthy emotions to have, especially when we're talking about whiteness, white supremacy, and family history. Um, really, when we start to um, fall into those patterns of behavior of guilt and shame, um, we shut down and, and then we're not doing ourselves or anybody else any good. Um, my focus today, like I said, um, is really going to be on examining family history. And I realize that for um, many people that that's just simply not um, something that is possible to do. So I want to make sure that it's clear that I've included all of my research um, in slides at the end of the presentation so that you can access different um, strategies for working on your own autoethnographic process if you are not interested in engaging in um, digging deep into your family history as part of that process. Um, I will also post um, towards the end all of the writing prompts that I have put together that I've used myself um, to help guide myself on this journey. So let's get started. So let's start with terminology. Um, it's important given the topic, um, just to be clear and to avoid any confusion. So one of the things I recommend when I'm talking about this with other people is that you write stuff down um, during this presentation not the notes on the content so much. We will share the slides with you if you're interested. Um, really, it's more about capturing your thoughts and feelings while we're talking about this topic and we're kind of moving through um, the stories that I'm gonna tell you and my own process. Um, you can always go back and review content, but you can't um, always easily access thoughts and feelings that you've had once a moment has passed. And that is what a lot of autoethnography is about, which I will define um, in detail in just a minute. So I want to start with um, defining white supremacy. Um, I realize there are other definitions. Um, this is the definition that I use in my research. So white supremacy and the racialized phenomenon it creates, whiteness, exists because of past and present conferred racial dominance, which in turn confers racial privilege. Um, like I said, I focus on aspects of white supremacy that include a continued pattern, and this is important, of widespread, everyday, well-intentioned practices and seemingly neutral policies, which white people often unwittingly carry out that maintain a system of racial injustice. Um, I also wanna clarify that I use the terms whiteness and white supremacy um, I use them as a synonym for each other um, and I use them interchangeably. And I don't do this to dismiss the impact and the power of white supremacy by trying to soften it up um, and using a euphemism like whiteness to make it more palatable for white people. Um, I use the term whiteness um, in conjunction and in lieu of white supremacy because my work is framed 
um, by critical whiteness theory. And critical whiteness theory um, extensively connects the um, whiteness is described as the effect of white supremacy. So the two are so deeply, deeply connected that it's my belief that to separate them out um, confuses the matter even more. So white supremacy, um, and as a result, then whiteness, um, just to be clear, um, does not equal all white people, just as all white people are not racist. Um, however, or similarly, um, while all white people in the United States benefit from whiteness and participate in perpetuating white supremacy, at, at some level, most white people do not identify as white supremacists. Um, I would say it's more than most, like almost all. Um, so actually, in fact, most white people in the United States identify as not racist and often don't see, let alone understand, the oppressive dominance that whiteness confers. So we run into the same issue um, when we're talking about whiteness and white supremacy that we run into with racism and racist. Um, racism in the context of critical whiteness scholarship is defined as the encompassing economic, ideological, political, social, and cultural structures, actions and beliefs that systematize, and systematize being a really operative word here, and perpetuate an unequal distribution of privileges, resources, and power among white people and people of color. So I use this definition to describe how racism is part of a structured social system because like white supremacy, looking at racism from a structural standpoint allows us to examine racialized society rather than racist individuals. Now, I am not suggesting that racist individuals do not exist, um, just like I am not suggesting that white supremacists do exist. They do, they, they most certainly do. But by framing racism through the lens of racial, social hierarchy and domination, um, my individual experience of being a white person no longer consumes center stage. And the systems that uphold whiteness start to become more visible to me as a white person. So I realize that other people use different definitions and have different contextual understanding for these terms. Um, I just wanna be clear how I define them from the beginning. So what is autoethnography? And why am I here to talk to you about it today? So um, autoethnography is best understood as a form of storytelling that uses personal experiences in a particular cultural setting to gain deeper knowledge. You're like, okay, what does that actually mean? Um, what it actually means is that it's easier, I think, to, and most people are more familiar with what ethnography is, so it's, it's helpful to look at ethnography to compare it to autoethnography. So ethnography, as many people are aware, is a form of social scientific inquiry, and it focuses on the study of people and culture usually in their own environment. Um, the difference here is that autoethnography focuses on the individual person or the researcher, and it focuses on personal reflection and self-consciousness. So I am essentially studying myself um, when I engage in autoethnography. I like to think of it as an illustration of sense-making. It's a sense-making process that can help us understand ourselves and the larger worlds that we inhabit. I'm not gonna leave you with just that definition. I'm gonna clarify just a little bit more. So when we're doing autoethnography, because autoethnography is something that we do, it is a, a process and a product. So autoethnography is experimental and it's participatory and it's written in the first person because it's about you, the person engaging in it. Um, it's typically narrative um, and it can contain anything from dialogue and emotion. It can contain um, 
artwork, it can contain drawing, it can contain music. It's basically a reflection of you yourself thinking about what is going on with you. I like to think of autoethnography as journaling with purpose, with intentionality, um, with trying to um, solve a problem. So the next leap is then what is critical ethnography? Because critical ethnography um, is what I am most interested in. And I think it is the most beneficial um, if we're really trying to get to the root of what is whiteness and what does it look like in higher education and how can we as white people um, start to identify it and then start to challenge it in, in a more intentional way. So the goal of all autoethnography is really to strive for social justice. However, critical ethnography takes this um, a step further because it really um, tries to do more than reveal how one fits into a power structure. Instead, um, critical autoethnography uh, auto um, seeks to interrogate, disrupt, and challenge what is often hegemonic injustice um, and systems of oppression by looking like really deep within ourselves with a critical lens. And it's really about deep. It's about depth. It's about going deeper than we normally go when we are thinking about our place, our role, how we exist. So from a historical um, connection, autoethnography really draws from critical theory um, because it attempts to deconstruct the very power structure that it seeks to expose. Um, as a method, it acknowledges the personal privilege from the outset um, and the power from the outset of the researcher, as well as the institutional um, aspect and systemic oppression. So in my case, I realized that as a white person, I was the power structure that needed to be deconstructed, deconstructed to be exposed. Um, I could no longer kind of look to institutional issues without starting to really dig deep within myself, knowing that I was a part of the institutional issues that I was seeing. So why focus on whiteness? Um, we could certainly do autoethnography and focus on any topic, but um, I personally believe that we need to as white people put a lot of energy into focusing on whiteness in higher ed. Um, and that is really because um, whiteness in higher ed and in the larger um, context of American society is pervasive, it's systemic, and it is ingrained in our culture. And until we start to do this, we are gonna stay in the same place no matter how good our intentions are. Um, this has a lot to do with the fact that um, the very large composition of whiteness in higher ed um, that then combines with decades of colorblind practices and policies that sought to diminish racial inequity, um, but have ultimately led to a lack of critical race consciousness in higher education research, practice, policy, and leaders. So we really need to reframe the situation if we want to start to address the problem of whiteness in higher ed. Um, the other issue with this, and the other reason we need to do it, is that while many of us know this is a problem, um, whiteness and systemic racism are still under addressed in contemporary higher education research and professional practice. Like We have just got to be doing more, and we've got to be talking about it more. Um, and I really can't stress this enough, and this is something that I found um, for myself. Um, we really have to get past this guilt and shame piece that many of us of white people have when we talk about racism, um, because it allows us to stay in this idea that racism is an isolated individual behavior rather than something that is historically deeply embedded in the fabric of US society. Um, 
it is the majority dominant racial discourse in the United States, as well as in higher education. And it goes unseen and challenged by those who benefit the most from its dominance and invisibility. So being one of those people that benefit the most from whiteness because I'm white, um, it becomes really important for me to continually develop my skills to see it. Um, further complicating all of this is that most people in the United States, just like most people think of themselves as non-racist, um, most people view themselves as colorblind, um, which adds to their perception that they're not racist. So if we can't see, um, we cannot start to develop a critical awareness of race. And obviously we can see it, we just have been conditioned to think that we don't. And we need to undo that piece. Um, basically in sum, if we don't examine whiteness in higher education, we are looking at the um, effect of racism, but not the cause. And whiteness is the cause. And we need to shift the paradigm and, and look to the cause. Um, and I believe that one of the ways that we can do that is for white people, we can start with ourselves and we can do some deep, deep personal um, consciousness building. And, and that will significantly um, help us to move forward. So how did I come to be here? How did I come to get interested in this? What is this really all about? So um, I was at Encore in 2018 in um, New Orleans and I had an epiphany. And an epiphany is defined as a sudden spiritual manifestation, whether from some object, scene, event, or memorable phase of mind. Um, and the manifestation is typically out of proportion, okay, um, from the significance that it produces. So when I was walking down the street in the French Quarter, um, I came across this sign um, that you see here. It's a tiled sign. And prior to the moment when I saw this sign, um, I don't know that I knew that New Orleans was a Spanish province, um, but I had certainly never thought about it before. And it was like a light went off for me. Um, and the light that went off was, it made me wonder um, if the stories that I had been told about my family were true. It was like, whoa. And you may, you, you won't see the connection yet, but I'll get there. Um, and once that light went off, I knew that there was this whole other world that I didn't understand. Um, I knew there was this whole other world that I didn't understand about my family history. And I knew that I needed to better understand myself, which need, meant that I needed to understand what it meant to be white much better than I did at the time. And I still, need to learn a whole, whole lot more. I think this is a lifelong journey. Um, if I really wanted to work towards um, genuine equity, inclusion, and anti-racism in my work. So um, I had already spent about a year working, um, putting together some preliminary dissertation research. And after that epiphany, I threw it out and I started over. And it developed um, using these foundational concepts of autoethnography, um, which allowed me then to um, use this epiphany as kind of the basis of my work um, and start collecting and analyzing the data, which was me. Um, specifically my research, which I've included at the end um, in slides, and I'm always happy to share more in-depth pieces with people if they're interested. Um, focused on my experiences at NCOR at 2018, the conference in 2018 and 2019, and the process that I went through learning the truth about my family history, which I now know is directly tied to white supremacy. Um, but I am not alone in that. Um, I think most people, most white people in the United States, um, if they dig deep, will find that connection as well. So that's what I'm here to challenge you to do. Okay, so using autoethnography to examine family history. 
Um, I get really excited at this point because this is where it becomes tangible to me. Um, so my journey began as I began to inquire about my family history and the stories that I had been told. Um, like many of us, I grew up on family stories. Um, and that's because our family stories are part of who we are. They're part sometimes of ancient oral tradition. They connect us to our ancestral past and they can really help us make sense of the present. They can provide some scaffolding for us so that we know who and where we are. And we typically believe our family stories, often without any questions asked. Even the ones that are clearly embellished and just a little bit outrageous, um, somehow over time, those even embellished stories, they start to become facts that we use to explain who we are and how we came to be here. Um, and those facts, they allow us to mythologize people. They put people up on a pedestal um, and they also put events up on a pedestal. And those stories and those mythologies justify who we are. And some can be a source of great pride and some can be a source of great shame. And what I have found is that the ones of great shame typically kind of fall off the radar. They don't travel with us the same way that the ones um, connected to our pride do. So what do we do if we find out that some of them aren't true? What if we find out that the versions um, of the stories that we know are the versions that we wanted the world to know and that our families wanted the world to know and that are not accurate reflections of who we are and how we came to be and how we have what we have. And that's an important piece here, how we have what we have. So I'm gonna start by telling you some um, down this road, um, some stories about my family. Um, and you'll hear some stories about my uh, maternal and paternal sides of my family. And um, we'll see what happens. Okay, so let's see here. These are the stories I grew up on. So um, a few questions I want you to consider while I'm telling you these stories. Um, what is your dominant family story? Just kind of keep these in the back of your mind. And if you have an idea, jot it down. Um, remember when I encouraged you to do that before? Just one word is often enough. Just get it down there. Um, so what is your dominant family story? Who is it about? What is the gender of the person in the dominant family story? What was their role in your family? What age group were they? Where did they come from? Um, do you remember the first time you heard this dominant family story? Or was it so ubiquitous that you can't pinpoint a time um, when you heard it for the first time? And then what are your most vivid family memories? Both the good and the bad. And part of this process is that it can't always be good. So if some of your most vivid memories are, are not positive, that is okay. Um, and that is actually something that you probably should spend some time, some time looking at. So once again, um, focus on thoughts and feelings that arise for you um, if they do while we're talking about these things. Okay, so um, these are my grandparents. They are my paternal grandparents. Um, my grandfather on the left, um, his name was Harry Kelly. He was born in Ottawa, Illinois in 1897. Um, and then on the right is my grandmother, Ann O'Brien, and she was born in Calumet, Michigan in 1905. So both Harry and Ann were the grandchildren of Irish immigrants who came to the U.S. around the 1830s. Um, and both of their families were ultimately successful in obtaining the American dream. Um, Harry had um, the opportunity to go to University of Notre Dame. And when he was graduating World War II, World War I, I apologize, had just started. So Harry and his entire class that was graduating at Notre Dame um, held their graduation at Fort Sheridan. And they enlisted as a body in the US Marine Corps 
to go fight in World War I. So they all went together. Um, Harry was sent to France where he was ultimately shot and then bayoneted in the leg um, and left for dead while attempting to rescue a fellow Marine at the Battle of Chateau Thierry in France. Um, ultimately, um, after spending a night um, in a trench, um, he was rescued, but because of the severity of his injuries, his leg was amputated above the knee in a Red Cross field hospital. He spent many months in hospitals um, and was eventually awarded the Quad de Guerre with Palm, which is considered the highest military honor to be bestowed by the French um, military for allied soldiers who showed exemplary, exemplary heroism in battle. Um, he was considered a hero when he came home and um, he was sent around the country um, by the military selling war bonds um, on his new wooden leg um, that obviously he had for the rest of his life. Um, ultimately, he was appointed to the district attorney's office in Detroit. He then went on to become Michigan state attorney, um, then Michigan secretary of state, and then a two-term governor from 1943 to 1947. And he spent the next 17 years um, on the Michigan state Supreme Court. He was a Republican, a devout Catholic, and he was equally as dedicated to his wife and six children. He worked really hard for everything he had. And even when he was governor, the Kelly family lived a modest lifestyle. He was a civil servant um, and he gave his life to the people of the United States. That's a pretty big story but that was, that was our story. Um, and I realized that some people may be hearing this and they're saying, I can't connect to that. This woman's up here talking about her grandfather who is the governor of Michigan. Um, I just ask you to hold on and stay with me for a few more minutes. So my grandmother, um, Anne, who was married to Harry, um, she was the first woman in our family to go to college on that side of the family. Um, she graduated from Sargent College, which is now part of Boston University in 1927, um, and she majored in physical education and dance. They both um, lived long lives, but Anne ultimately outlived Harry. Um, they had 21 grandchildren, and they were devoted to each other until the end. And that's really the family story that I grew up on. I never met my grandfather. He passed away a couple years before I was born but I did spend every summer with my grandmother until I was 13. And so this was something that, um, this, these are stories that I felt very connected to. So what happens when we find out something else? Um, I'm gonna share with you the truth that I discovered. Um, and this happened as part of the process of my dissertation research. So I stumbled across a reference to the 1943 Detroit race riot while I was reading for my dissertation research. And I was struck by the date. 1943 just stood out to me and was screaming at me. Um, and it's because my grandfather was known as the war governor, meaning that he was the governor during World War II. 1943, World War II. It was like another one of those incredibly jarring, startling moments for me. And it was startling because I had never heard it mentioned before. It had never been talked about. It had never been um, referenced. There was no indication that it ever happened. It was literally like it had been erased and it had never existed. It just hadn't happened. Um, nowhere in our family oral narrative or the volumes of print materials do we have, um, have I seen any reference to my grandfather's connection to the Detroit race riots in 1943 until I looked outside of my family. And then once I looked outside of my family, it was like whiteness and it was everywhere. Um, the riots lasted for three days. 
The official death toll was 34 with 676 people injured and $2 million in property damage. 25 of the 34 um, that died were black. 18 out of those 25 black people that were killed were shot by police, many of them in the back. And four times as many black people were arrested even though there were only 10% of the Detroit population. And I cannot share this today without once again coming back to the fact that like, what has changed since then? Um, you know, on the national stage right now, there is a trial happening um, related to the murder of George Floyd. These things are directly connected and we have got to talk about them. So I'm gonna read this to you. I'm aware that you all can read, um, so please forgive me. But um, given that we are trying to contain time, um, I'm not sure how long to leave a slide that is this dense up if I don't read it. So this came from the Detroit Metro News in 2003. And the reason for it being written in 2003 was that it was um, the 60 year anniversary of the riots in Detroit. So Mayor Jeffries and Governor Harry Kelly met with local commanders of the armed forces at Detroit's federal building. As they debated how to get manpower on the streets, a tumult from Fort Street distracted them. They rushed to the window to see a white mob chasing a terrified black man with torn clothing and a bleeding face. Despite this shocking scene, the men quibbled over the legal ramifications of martial law. Authorities closed ranks with the police and the political establishment, turning their backs on black grievances. Governor Kelly stacked a fact-finding committee with prosecutors and city, county, and state police. The report exonerated the police and condemned white violence, but excused it as retaliatory. It placed blame for the riot squarely on Detroit's blacks. Um, there was um, extensive documentation of the events. Um, the NAACP um, wrote articles and reports. Um, and once again, this was something that I had never seen or heard any reference to my family's connection to this event. Now, you may all be sitting there going, you are the most naive people. How did you not connect these dates um, with where your family was at the present time? And I think honestly, because it had just never been brought up, we just never thought about it. Um, that is absolutely not an excuse, but it's the only answer that I can personally come up with um, because we didn't know that it existed and we didn't even think it was possible. Um, to this point, um, there have never been any documented consequences for my family about our connection to this. Um, nor do I believe that there have been any undocumented consequences either, um, which means there's never been any atonement. There's never been any, um, I, this may be the first time um, on this big of a stage that it has been publicly recognized. So um, I wanna share this with you um, because this is what an example of reflexive autoethnographic writing can look like. Um, so this was writing directly from um, my autoethnographic process of what I was thinking and feeling when I first found out this information about my grandfather. So um, he waited for 24 hours and quibbled over legal precedent while watching a white mob chase a bleeding black man down the street. Did that man die? Was he one of the 25 dead men? I have read this many times since I first discovered it. And every time I read it, my soul feels like it's collapsing inside of me. Because the man who allowed this to happen had the power to stop it, and he didn't. And that man was my grandfather, a man that I have been told time and time again was a man of honor and principle, a man of justice. Um, his were not the failed actions of a bystander lacking power and agency to make the racially motivated bloodshed end. He was not a bystander. He was the author and commander in chief of the events. 
And so that um, is an example of kind of what autoethnography can look like um, if you kind of put yourself in it and use your experiences to start to tease out what is what is really going on. But you can't be afraid to um, to get into it, and and you've got to be honest because doing it kind of up here and not going deep, it's it's really not going to provide you with um, the experience that it could. Okay, so this is the other side of my family. Um, this is the, my mom's side of the family and more of the stories that I was told. So this is my um, grandmother and grandfather. My grandfather's name was Charles Rain Romero. Um, he was, we called him Ray, so did everybody else. And this is my grandmother, Mary Helen Quinn. Um, Mary Helen Quinn was born in 1912 in Indiana and Ray was born in 1901 in Dallas, Texas. Um, when Ray was born, he was premature. So premature, in fact, that the story goes that he fit into a shoebox and his tiny body in the shoebox um, would get cold. So his mother, who's my great grandmother, would put it on the stove um, to try and warm him up and keep him warm before incubators. Um, once um, Ray was about one years old, his parents decided to move from Dallas and they took a train to San Francisco and literally the story goes to seek their fortune. So that's what they did. They got on a train, um, they went west with many other people to seek their fortune. Um, they ended up surviving the um, San Francisco earthquake, um, but because of the earthquake, Ray contracted polio. He was already frail. Um, he contracted polio and spent um, a great deal of time, no one's sure quite how long, um, in an iron lung in the hospital. Um, he had health problems for the rest of his life, but they never stopped him. They never got in his way. He continued to persevere. Um, when he was 14, he left home and he made his way to Southern California where he slept on the beach for months and months um, looking for work until he finally found steady work as a janitor in one of the earliest film studios that was popping up there in Southern California in the LA area. Um, he kept working and he worked his way up and he eventually became one of the first professional makeup artists. And he continued to do that work until he was about 70 years old. He had a stroke at 50 and after he recovered, he went back to work because that's just what he did. He worked really, really hard all the time. Um, he never made it past elementary school, um, but he was a kind and generous man. And he was incredibly proud that he owned his house outright um, when he finally retired and that he never bought anything on credit because he had lived through the depression and believed that you paid, you paid cash money um, for what you wanted. And if you couldn't afford it, you couldn't have it. Um, by all standards, just like my other side of the family, um, he achieved that American dream when he died and left his paid off house to his family. That was his goal. And while his last name was Romero in Southern California um, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, he didn't speak Spanish, which was unusual. Um, and he claims that neither of his parents ever spoke Spanish. So no connection to the Spanish language whatsoever. Um, then there's my grandmother, who was Helen Quinn. Um, Helen was the daughter of a woman whose family came from Norway. Um, Helen moved to Los Angeles as a child with her single mom. And she ended up being a dancer and a, um, and a swimmer. She loved to swim. So um, you may be wondering why I'm still focusing on this part of my family. The other half didn't get this much time. And if you'll just hang in there for a minute, you'll see why. So these are my grandfather, Ray, um, his parents. So Henry Romero here, um, standing next to Annie Clifton Presley, his, his mom. Um, Annie was born in Dallas. Um, she was from a poor family and she had no other history. That's all we knew. Um, she died really young. She died at 35. 
So um, none of my mom's siblings ever got to know her. Um, these are really the only photos we have for her. And if you remember, Ray left home at 14. So not very much connection whatsoever. Um, all we knew was Dallas, Texas, and that she had died young and she had had my grandfather young. Um, the gentleman to her right is my great, great grandfather. His name is Henry Romero. Um, he was also born in Texas. It was just assumed that he was born in Dallas because that's where he met Annie. And like Annie, there was no other information that we had. And so I started doing some extensive genealogical research, trying to figure out who these people were, what they did, where they came from, who their families were, all of those things. And I couldn't find anything. It's, it's basically what genealogists call brick wall. I just came up with nothing. Um, and for a while, I just kind of stopped. And then I decided it was time to dig a little deeper. Um, as I started to dig a little deeper, I discovered that um, this woman, Sophia Aragon, was my great, great grandmother and the mother of Henry. Um, it doesn't matter if you're losing track. It's just important to kind of keep the thread of the story. Um, we believed when we first discovered this information that Sophia emigrated from Spain to Texas where she met her husband, Francisco, and they had their child, um, Henry, who went on to marry Annie and have my grandfather, Ray. Um, we didn't know anything about them other than that, but um, my mom started to remember that she had been told that they had come from Spain. Um, so that's just what, that's just what we believed. Um, since Ray, my grandfather had been estranged from his father and um, his mother died so young, there was really no way to verify any of this. Okay, so what happens when we find out who they really are? Um, after a lot of failed attempts, um, I decided and I did not make the decision lately to take an autosomal, autosomal uh, DNA test. And I was concerned about taking it for many reasons, um, for the sake of privacy, um, but also because I just really don't support the idea that a blood test can tell you who you are and where you're from. But the curiosity had the better of me. And so I took the test. And um, once again, when I got that information back, everything changed. So my great grandfather, known as Henry, turns out his name was actually Enrique. He was not from Dallas at all. He was from Las Vegas, New Mexico. Um, Las Vegas was founded, I came to find out later after doing a ton of research, um, from a large land grant from the Spanish government. And thus families had title passed down to them generation after generation. Um, however, once the United States acquired New Mexico from Mexico, most of those land grant titles were considered null and void and the titles were um, transferred over to the US government. So um, essentially their family had been in New Mexico for a very, very long time um, and had lost access to the opportunities that they had had. Um, both of the families, the Romero and the Aragon families that I was descended from, um, it turned out they've been there for many, many years. So, um, so long in fact, that it turns out that they came in the 1500s. Um, they were part of the first group of Spanish conquistadors to make their way through Mexico to what is now Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, a significant number of documents substantiate that through the DNA connection also that many of them were crypto Jews um, which were essentially people fleeing the Spanish Inquisition um, from Spain. Um, and they went to New Mexico and were essentially hiding in plain sight. Um, there was a group of 500 people that came from Spain. Um, it's estimated that maybe 10 to 20% fell into this crypto group Jew category. Um, and they came in 1598, which just for some context is eight years before Jamestown. So it was a really long time ago. Um, what I came to discover 
was um, that once again, I knew very little about US history, especially in connection with my uh, family history. So they came with the Juan de Anate expedition. And um, what I learned once again was just kind of devastating. And it, it's interesting because it was devastating, but um, it shouldn't have been because I know these things happened, but somehow it changed for me and it became real when it was related to the people that I was connected to. So um, Anate and his soldiers, like all of the other Spanish conquistadors that um, came through and colonized all of Central, South, and a great deal of North America, um, committed genocide in the name of Catholicism um, and empire building. And while some of the men in the initial party brought wives with them um, that were born in Spain um, or in Mexico City, but were of um, Spanish descent, um, many others took um, indigenous women from communities along their journey all the way um, from Veracruz to Santa Fe. Um, these women were, and men, were kidnapped um, and they were baptized with Catholic names um, and they were converted um, and forced to work for Spanish families, often for um, generations. And it struck me as I was reading all of this that um, once again, I was connected to ancestors that were responsible for kidnapping, rape, and genocide. And I knew nothing about it. Just like my grandfather on the other side, I knew nothing about it because I'm white and I will always be white. And I have been protected from this information my mother was protected, her mother, we have all been protected for generations. So um, what happened, I came to find out, was that Enrique, my great grandfather, found himself um, on the side of a border that had moved and he had the wrong name. Um, so to white Americans in 1900, um, Enrique Romero and his family were Mexican, regardless of the color of their skin. Um, they were all very light skinned, um, but they were Mexican. And it was understood that people from New Mexico, um, this was by white settlers um, in what was now the United States. It was understood that people from New Mexico were of mixed Indian and Mexican descent, which made them not white. Um, they were people of color, regardless of how light their skin was. Um, this made them Indio Mexican, and it meant that they um, lost access to opportunities that many had had for a long time. Um, therefore, their families, not just my family's families, um, lost access to the land, all the things that they had been um, living on and doing. Granted, they had taken them from other people for a very long time. So my great-grandfather left New Mexico at 18, um, 12 years before New Mexico um, became a state. And he left his Spanish Pueblo history behind him. And he became Henry James Romero, a white American from a Spanish family that had immigrated in the last 40 years. He had two brothers. They did the exact same thing. They left Las Vegas, New Mexico. One went from being Ricardo Romero um, to Richard Romero. And then another went so far as to change his name from Arturo Romero to Arthur Bond. I have no idea where Bond came from, um, but it's um, it's not a stretch <laughs> um, to think that people would make up um, as anglicized names as possible um, to begin to access opportunities that they saw would be available to them. Um, and they were able to do this because not only were they bilingual, but because of the light color of their skin. They could speak English, change their names, and become white Americans. So um, this is another excerpt um, that I wrote about. So I must come to terms with the fact that I am who I am. And I have what I have because the torturers, and in this case, the colonizers won. But I simultaneously benefit and lose at the same time. I lose because of what I will never know, culture, language, extended family, tradition. I must navigate the sense of loss and grief that I am feeling 
that I have no right to have. Again, I find myself staring down the barrel of what has been kept from me, what has been kept from all of us, and all the while I continue to benefit. So I wanna clarify um, because of what I just shared. Um, I am white, I am culturally, I am socially, economically, politically, and psychologically white. My identity is white. I do not claim to be anything else. Um, the DNA test I took um, does not make me an indigenous person um, and it does not make me a person of color. Um, I have ancestral ties to detribalized people from the New Mexico region, but I don't know who they are and I cannot claim that nor do I want to in any way because it's not mine. Um, but what I do claim is the importance of telling this story and taking responsibility for what my ancestors have done and what I believe I will perpetuate if I remain silent. Um, I also think it's important to um, recognize that um, what my great grandfather did um, was he took advantage and he made an opportunistic move um, by becoming a white American. And it is um, something that many, many people who immigrated to the United States did. Um, but I think that what makes this story a little bit unique was that essentially they were already here. Um, they just had to change um, what they were doing um, in order to start to access those benefits. So we're down to only 10 minutes. So I'm gonna skip through the next part. Um, I apologize, I want to, um, well, I'll hit on it just a little bit. So this is my um, great, great grandmother who is Annie Clifton Presley and she was married to Henry. And what I found out about her was that she was 12 years old when she had my grandfather. Um, and even then um, in 1900, 1901, that was an unusual event. It was not typical for 12 year old girls to um, have babies. Um, it, it was another one of those kind of jarring, shocking moments. We'd been told she was young. I think we all assumed that meant like 17, um, not 12, not a child. Um, what I discovered from, um, also from taking the DNA test because it connects you to other members of your extended family um, was that we actually were able to find a ton of information about Annie's family and it was equally as disturbing as the other members of my family that we had discovered. Um, her family had been in Georgia and Alabama for a very long time. Um, Annie's family had moved to Dallas after the Civil War because they lost all of their land. Um, Annie's family had, I think at this point, been in Georgia and Alabama in the South from about the 1700s. Um, her relatives fought in the Civil War um, for the Confederate Army. They fought in the Revolutionary War and they enslaved many generations of people. Um, this was another really upsetting surprise. And again, I feel like I sound naive when I say that, but there had never been any connection to that part of our family history. So it is, um, it was a surprise. Um, because we didn't even know we were from that part of the world. So um, this is a, an example of the 1840 federal census. Um, I replicated it that I discovered throughout my research um, that documents that um, in 1840, Annie's family, um, which would have been her father and her grandfather, um, enslaved, owned um, 13 people. Um, and like I said, I am sure that the more I dig deeper into this, the farther back I go, we will find out that this, um, that there are many more stories like this. I don't think it was a one generation event. So I wrote reflexively about that as well, and it's included in the slides. Um, I'm gonna skip through it. Um, I hate to do that, but I wanna make sure that I leave you with the tools to begin to do autoethnography. So why do this? I'm sure some of you are listening to me and you're like, this is pretty miserable. <laughs> why, why do this thing? <clears throat> well, what I have learned is that I cannot separate my personal history 
and my personal experience from my professional practice. They're one and the same. So I know now that this process that I went through and I am still going through is absolutely necessary so I can understand who I am and how I came to see the world the way I do. And a lot of it is subconscious. Like a lot of it has never been said to me, but it's just the actions of people that have been formative in my life. So it was really critical for me doing this to be able to come to terms with the reality of being a white woman and how whiteness is in fact white supremacy. And acknowledging that I believe is the first step towards um, working towards genuine anti-racism. Um, our white family narratives justify our privilege and frame how we understand power. Um, our family narratives and discourses are built off these bigger national level ones that are like manifest destiny and work ethic and all this other stuff that becomes really directly tied to the present, even though we don't necessarily see it. Um, it became important for me to take all those things apart. And it's really detailed out for you in my research slides at the end. So the big takeaways and why I'm encouraging people to engage in autoethnography are that I now know that I'm complicit um, in a way that I didn't understand before. I also know that my family is complicit. And because of that work, I also know that I reproduce white supremacy every day because I benefit from it. And that it will take a lifetime of work for me to really start to move away from that as far as possible. And it's not so much about what I didn't know or what my family didn't know, but why we didn't know it that I think demands attention. Um, we can no longer not know if we want to move towards anti-racism. And we can't be involved in anti-racist work doing systems level work as white people if we cannot see the systems clearly. And we can't see them if we don't see ourselves in them. If we can't situate ourselves in those systems and understand how we um, contribute to them and maintain those systems, then we're not ready. And we really need to spend time digging through um, all of our own past experiences. So we can use autoethnography to build critical race cognizance um, by destruct, deconstructing ourselves in our family history. Um, we can make these connections to white supremacy visible by connecting them to things in the past. And that is necessary because we simply have a hard time seeing it because we're so conditioned to it. So only through seeing that my family enslaved human beings, only through seeing that um, I was the product of conquest um, and colonization was I able to start to connect to the present. Um, and I really believe that um, we need to learn to see so that we can start to take responsibility. So reflecting on whiteness is really not something that comes naturally to white people. Um, we've been generally taught to not see color, but we've also been taught not to speak of it. We have been taught to not speak about race. It is just, it's a no-go for most white people. Um, and as a result, we have no idea how to talk about it. We don't know what whiteness is. Um, and we don't understand how it's connected to the formation of the United States. Okay, so how do you do it? How do you do autoethnography? All right, you do not have to wait for an epiphany. Or maybe today is your epiphany. Maybe you wrote something down um, while I was chattering away about my family history um, that kind of provoked something inside of you. Um, if not, just start writing. Um, something will come. You have to be honest with yourself if you're gonna do this. Um, and if you're resisting honesty, ask yourself why and dig deeper. If you find yourself being like, ooh, I don't wanna think about that. Think about it, dig deeper. Why do you not wanna think about it? Go to NCOR. I cannot stress enough. Like um, sign up this year for the virtual conference and then next year when you can go in person, go. There are so many opportunities at NCOR that you will be able to reflect upon if you put yourself in those challenging situations, um, you will just leave with a treasure trove of information about yourself, but you gotta spend time reflecting on it. 
Um, use some or all of the prompts that I'm going to share with you, and I'm also going to put them in the text box. Um, the biggest thing is to just keep digging, to keep thinking, start reflecting. Start asking questions about who you are and where you came from. Who are you? Where do you come from? Just keep going back there. Journal. Carry one with you all the time. Journal, journal, journal. Write it down. I have one in my car. I have one next to my desk. I have one next to my bed. Um, I am the crazy person that sometimes pulls over on the side of the street and just starts writing. I mean, I, I find a safe place to go, but I'm sure people are like, what is she doing? Um, it's because I, I hear something or I have a thought and I write it down. Um, reflect and write and then reflect more on anything that comes up for you. Um, anytime something happens that makes you feel even just a little bit uneasy, write it down and reflect on it. It doesn't have to be connected to race or whiteness, but it probably is if you're a white person and it's making you uncomfortable. So um, dig into that. And then this can be really helpful. Organize your journals and your notes every once in a while by theme. Start to be like, okay, where does this go? Um, and then reflect some more because what you're gonna start to see is some themes popping up about you and your existence and how you understand the world. Um, talk to people who look different than you. I can't stress this enough. As white people, we really, really kind of shy away from this a lot of the time. Um, talk to people who look different than you and talk to people who look like you and then think about it. <laughs> how did you feel? What was different about each of the experiences? And start noticing and seeing everything. Our brains are these incredible supple, supple organs. And if you start to notice um, when you're uncomfortable or when you see things that seem not right or you hear things, write it down. Um, that's tell that's your, your intuition telling you something. It's your intuition telling you that you should be focusing on this. Okay, so here um, are some general awareness prompts. Um, I have general awareness prompts race awareness prompts and family awareness prompts um, for all of you if you're interested. Um, like I said, I'll put them in the PDF. Um, I'll put the PDF in the uh, chat section and you can print them out. Um, I also have a PDF for um, all of the citations that are included in this. And like I said before, these slides keep going um, and will lay out um, some of my dissertation research. So I'll just go through a couple of these prompts in the last kind of two minutes that we have, and then um, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Rungu, and she is going to uh, manage questions in the chat. So how did your family stories shape your life, your identity? How, do your family, how did your family shape your opportunities, your worldview, your view of others? especially your view of people who are different than yourself? How do you know what you've been told is true? What do you know about being white or whiteness? So the idea with these prompts is that I don't suggest that you just hit them once. Um, like if you're a super type A person and you're like, I need to answer these questions and then move on. Um, I encourage you because I lean a little bit that way um, to try and loosen up about it and um, come back to them. This is something that you come back to and you kind of check yourself and you think about how your thinking has changed over time and you, you don't get an answer right away. This isn't a, I'm gonna sit down and write a kind of position statement on myself and then it's one and done. Um, I spent two years on my research. Um, clearly, um, probably maybe two other people in the universe are interested in doing that. Um, I get that, but this is something you can do casually um, throughout the course of your regular day and your regular life. It doesn't need to be formalized. Um, race prompts. When was the first time you remember noticing race? What stands out to you about the feeling that you had? Have you ever talked to anyone about it? Why? Um, were you raised to be colorblind? How do you feel about it? How comfortable are you talking about color. If you're uncomfortable, 
ask yourself why. Remember a time when you heard someone you were close to say something racist or behave in a racist way. What did you feel? What did you do? Why, why not? Do you wish you had done something? Do you wish you had said something? Um, you gotta dig deep with this stuff and it's uncomfortable. It's, it's not easy. Um, have you ever race, witnessed racial violence? And then challenge yourself. Be like, what is violence actually? Like, what does that actually look like? Um, do you call yourself white or Caucasian? And if one or the other, why? Um, and this last one is, is a heavy one for me. Um, can you have open conversations about whiteness with your family? How does your answer make you feel? So like I said, um, there's another two pages of these. I'm not gonna go through them, um, but uh, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Dr. Ringo and her team. And thank you all for having me. Um, I timed it, I was so close. I did a run through and I somehow managed to add a couple minutes um, that I hadn't added when I did my practice. So I apologize for having to rush through the end, but I am greatly appreciative of being here with you today. Thank you so very much, Dr. Starr. And uh, the slides are going to be available. Uh, I think Kathy is going to drop an mm -hmm. email address mm -hmm. in the chat and we shall share uh, Dr. Starr's PowerPoint with all her citations and the PDFs. I don't know whether I wanna comment on the presentation, but I can say thank you so very much uh, for being so reflective, so courageous, uh, being vulnerable and challenging us to be vulnerable, to deconstruct who we are. Because in knowing ourselves, then we are able to understand uh, who we are and able to relate to others and, and understand our, our community and our society. So we do have several questions for you and I am going to do my best for the rest of the 15 minutes. So one of the questions that have been asked here is, how have your family reacted to this? Because obviously not many families want any of their history uncovered, especially if it's uncomfortable. Um, yes. <laughs> um, my, well, my father is no longer alive. So um, that, that's what, and, and most of his family members are not. I have cousins who are. Um, my mother is still alive. We are very close. She knows all about it. Um, at first, she was kind of like, that can't be. <laughs> um, it, and it was interesting to me, um, the part that she struggled with. Um, I automatically assumed, because it was the piece that I struggled with the most, was finding out that our family had um, lived in the South, fought for the Confederate Army, and enslaved human beings. To me, that was the thing that I thought she would be um, kind of most, find, find most jarring. Um, but for her, it was to find out that um, her family was actually of, of Mexican descent um, and that that had been kept from her. Um, she shared a story with me about um, growing up in Los Angeles in the 1950s and 60s and going to job interviews and people would say, oh, your last name is Romero, Mexican or Spanish? And she would mm -hmm. automatically answer Mexican. Um, and that, that really struck her. And that was, um, something that was really difficult, but she started tying together all of these things about her own dad, um, that suddenly made sense after starting to learn these things. So that went well. Um, it has not, it has not gone as well with my dad's side of the family. I can tell you that much. Um, I think my brother is actually here today. Um, so, um, he's, he's definitely supportive. Um, but it's a challenge and it's even been a challenge for my kids too. Um, and we're still trying to figure out how we talk about it. Well, Devin Randall Kelly is here. <laughs> my brother, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting Dr. Starr. So uh, we all agree it, it, it can be challenging. Uh, there are folks who also want to know about the DNA uh, so do you recommend, what do you recommend uh, for the DNA? Um, okay, so here's what I recommend. I mean, are they asking like 
should they do it or like so here's my first caution. Do you recommend this, uh, the DNA to go deeper into family history? Is there something you recommend or maybe I, just interviews and such? I think that if you're unable to find what you're looking for, that it, for me, it opened up. I mean, I didn't know it was amazing once I did it, because if you select to be connected to other people who share your DNA, you can suddenly start to see this huge kind of ecosystem of extended family. And um, that's how I found out that my mother's family was from Las Vegas, New Mexico, and um, had been there in that area and in Santa Fe for a very long time. And that I have hundreds, if not over a thousand second and third and fourth cousins that live there that I had no idea were there. Um, so that was helpful for me. I don't think we would have ever figured it out beyond this idea that they had lived in Texas and the records just simply didn't exist. Um, because the records do exist. <laughs> the One of the amazing things about the Catholic Church is that there is an abundance of records, especially in New Mexico, um, from the late 1500s until the present day. So it was very useful for me. Um, I can tell you, though, that you can find out some pretty upsetting things. Um, my mother found out that she had a half-brother she didn't know about, um, and he had already he had already died um, many years ago, and he had been significantly older than her, but, um, that was another story that didn't come out. And so I think people have to be prepared if they go down that DNA route that, um, not only can you find some interesting things, but you can find some things that you really weren't looking for. And, um, I, I think it's just something to be aware of. So because th this is uh, research that might be published, uh, somebody wants to know, Amanda wants to know, how did you go about your IRB permissions? Yeah. Because, you know, once you publish, it goes out there, it's out there. The card is out of the bag and the impact will be broader than your immediate family. So how did you work with the IRB through this? Um, because it was an autoethnography and because it was totally focused on myself, um, I didn't run into any challenges with IRB. Um, I thought I would, um, but because the research was really based on um, my own reflections um, and those were tied to public data, public information. Um, it, like if you go on to, um, I mean, first of all, with my, my grandfather that was the governor, I mean, you can just Google his name and all of that. None of that is, is private information. Um, and none of the information that is on any of the genealogy sites is private if it's tied to public documentation. So, um, and really, um, and I'm happy to share my dissertation with anybody who's interested. It always just comes back to my feelings, my reflections about factual data that I've found. So um, if people are unwittingly exposed Essentially, they were already unwittingly exposed because their information is public record. So you've touched on on racism, white supremacy, uh, and how all this is touched with some of our, uh, our experiences. So somebody is asking if whiteness is the cause of systemic racism, then is it correct that racism towards white people by black people doesn't exist? Oh, that question. Um, okay, here's the deal. Here's my answer to that question. I, students ask me that question all the time. So white system, uh, white supremacy and racism are systemic. They are, they were developed by human beings, by white people to give power to white people. That I think the question really comes down to like, does reverse racism exist? And in my opinion, the answer is absolutely not um, because white people, still hold um, a significant amount of power in the United States um, and people of color are still at a significant disadvantage. So anytime there is a group of people that holds and maintains power, mm -hmm. they are the only people that have the power to perpetrate and inflict um, racism. If we are looking at it as a system, which I strongly encourage people to do. So can you imagine this being a project for students in a cultural anthropology class? That's from Renee Garcia. 
I sure can. I think that would be so exciting. So I think that it's a, it can be something that it, it could be a project, it could be a writing assignment. Um, I think it, it can be any number of things. And I think it has um, and could have some incredible value in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So Daniela wants to know, um, this is what she writes. I'm part of an anti-racism accountability group where I work. Do you recommend focusing on this work before or in conjunction with trying to devise policy or practice shifts in our work? I would ask what the kind of composition of that anti-racist group was. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's um, filled predominantly with white people, um, I think this kind of work is incredibly helpful before you try and work towards policy. Um, if it is a group that has um, a significant representation of people of color in it, then I think then the, the white folks need to be doing this work. Um, but I don't think that you need to hold up the process to move towards policy and action. I, I think what I'm trying to say here is that if a group is, if an anti-racist work group or a DNI group or wh whatever you want to call it is um, primarily composed of you know, good white people who have good intentions. Yeah, she is saying they are mostly white. Then, then I think this this work is really important. Um, Only one non-black person. Yeah. yeah, if you're mostly white, then I think this stuff needs to come first. That's just my personal opinion. And and I think you need to get people of color in that group. Um, you need to be. You need to work on looking at who's in the room and who's not in the room. Um, because one of the things we really like to do as white people is talk for other people. <laughs> and um, we need to be really conscientious about that because our intentions are good. I don't mean to sound like I'm, I'm bashing. I think it's wonderful that um, when people step up and they want to do something. But I think we just have to be really cautious. Yeah, intentions can be good, but the impact <laughs> right. intentions have impact. can be really yeah. you know, negative. And and Donovan is encouraging folks to read anti-racist, um, how to be an anti-racist by yeah. Ibram Kendi. Yeah, it's excellent. So we have a couple of people who actually want to know what company did you use? Um, Was it 23 and Me, Ancestry.com or? Um, so this is where I start to get uncomfortable too, because I don't want to be promoting any of these companies because they are- Exactly, exactly. They are, um, they're all like capitalistic money-making profit machines. So please keep no, that. Let them know they can use whichever they want. Yeah, you can use whatever you want. Um, they all have different, there's actually a ton of resources out there if you want to start to look at it. So if you want to um, really dig into your DNA because you want to find your ancestral ties, there are a couple that are more focused on that. Um, if you're really just more interested in connecting to your genealogical research, um, there's ones that are on that. I can tell you that I ended up doing all of them um, because you can do one and then upload them to the rest and the others are free. So um, there's my answer. Um, but <laughs> do your research and see what it is that you're actually looking for so that you can yeah. get what you want. What, what you really want to find out and then right. get the right company for that. Yeah. So Glenn is asking a very important question here. and. Um, have you thought on the relevance of white racial identity development models like the Helms model to ethnographies on whiteness? Have I thought about them? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think that it is, um, so when we're, so I, just, I wanna be clear that like, when we're looking at, um, autoethnography compared to ethnography, we're really talking about different things, right? So I, I don't really feel skilled enough to, to respond to questions related to ethnography, but mm -hmm. I do think that um, all of these kind of disciplines or methods, um, it, it kind of comes back to what we just talked about. Like, what is the intentionality behind it, right? What are we seeking to do? What are we trying to understand? And where, where, where are we going with it? What is the what is the purpose? So when I start thinking about um, things of this nature, I really start to look. I, I this whole process has made me, I think, stronger looking at things up here than I used to be. And I, I really want to kind of take things apart and start asking those questions like why, how, 
Um, what is, does it, do the intentions align with um, what the impact could be? Um, I don't know if that really answered the question, but I'm willing to give it another go if you feel like it didn't answer it properly. Well, we'll keep thinking about it because yeah. we, we are almost out of time and I okay. want to get in a couple of questions here. Uh, because this is such important work, and I, I agree with, with Renee here, this is such important work for oh. us to think about who we are and deconstructing who we are. So are you going to create some kind of pedagogical approach to learning this? Because definitely this looks like a, a good way to uh, not only approach others to think about themselves, but also for ourselves. Um, yes and yes. So um, this is um, probably, I don't know, how, I stopped looking at the number of participants because once it got over 25, I was like, ah. Um, I think this is probably the largest group that I've, it is absolutely the largest group. Yeah, I've, you had almost 200 people in here today. Okay, well, that's, see, that's absolutely terrifying, but I'm thrilled to have been here. I'm glad I didn't know. <laughs> um, but this is kind of my um, kind of first presentation of, of this big of a place um, with this big of a, a venue. And I clearly need more time, but because I think it's important to provide the context for how I got here. But um, when people go, if they want to go and look through those kind of the questions, the prompts, um, I am absolutely interested in um, starting to develop more of a pedagogical model, but that, that's where I'm starting from, is this place of like, how do we start to think about it? And also like, how do we bring people in? Because people have to want to do this. And it's not something that um, you can have a required diversity training at work and make people do. Like you're not going to get um, what you want out of it. So, so don't just start like, because we have to bring people to want to do this. Right. Uh, there are a couple of folks here who are asking, so how do you encourage folks to do this kind of self-examination of their whiteness well, without so, leading them to being defensive, being right. angry, uh, without feeling like we are, they are being judged? How do you encourage faculty and staff to actually do this work? And for others, without losing their jobs? Because yeah. you know you could definitely lose your job just for this conversation. <laughs> I, I could. It's a re it's a real thing, and, and not just you. I'm I'm not yeah. seeing you, but you know um, we know how this goes. So I wrote this for myself. Well, you can't see it because I've got this ridiculous screen behind me. But um, on that, I was talking to someone that I value and respect deeply the other day, and I said I'm doing this thing, and there's a lot of people who aren't going to like it, and it, it it could really have a personal impact for me. And she said it is not a choice. You don't get to choose. You're doing mm -hmm. this. It's not a choice. Stand in justice justice is coming. And that was very, very powerful for me. But um, to the first part of the question, um, this is Encore. So I didn't spend my usual kind of warming people up period of, I am not a scary white lady, and I am not here to make you cry. Um, but I have done trainings. I did one recently in person um, where I really needed to spend a lot of time on that because the people that were there really didn't want to be there and they weren't sure why they were there and they didn't know what it was about. Um, but um, one of the things that was said to me afterwards was, wow, you're not as scary as I thought you would be. <laughs> like, okay, but I, I, I put effort into that, right? So, and when I say that, I mean, we don't need to soften things up. We don't need to be euphemisms, but we just need to be gentle when we are bringing people into this conversation Yeah. for the, it, for the first time, for the second time, for the third time. Like if, if it was an encore, I would have spent a lot of time on that. Like just kind of gentle bringing in, like what can yeah. we help you with? Well, standing justice, who, who said that quote? Who said it? Um, a woman down the hall from me. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we have ran out of time, Dr. Starr, but I can tell you this was captivating. It was reflective. It was bold. It was courageous. So I am asking all attendees, please drop a thank you for Dr. Harley Starr. Uh, and yes, this is Encore. We are bold and we won't stop talking because this is what we do. And this work is important. It is and important. thank you for plugging in for uh, our 33rd annual conference, June 7th. 
So you welcome for more captivating conversations. But I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, our team at Anchor, our team at Sorenson, our closed captioners, our ASL, all of you attendees, uh, this broadcast is going to be available in about a week. If you want the slides from Dr. Starr, you can email anchor webinars at ou.edu. Where can we find your dissertation? Um, it's actually, um, if you go, if you search through the, it's on the Idaho State University um, website, it's available um, to anybody who searches for it. And I'm also happy to email it and send it to every anyone who's interested. And if you and can send it to anchor, then they can request us okay. uh, and we shall distribute that. So thank you so very much, everybody, to my team and to Dr. Starr and to everyone who attended. This was amazing. And you know what? The work continues. Let us stand for justice. Let us be bold. We can stop now. From the University of Oklahoma in Norman, I am Dr. Jenny Rongo. Thank you very much and see you next time.